the Georgia Baptist Mission Board Discipleship Team, led by Scott Sullivan, exists to help churches take the next step toward becoming a healthy, disciple-making church. We've developed tools to help you, like the Watershed Principle, which identifies six main ministries needed to be a healthy church. The Spark Conference, a total church strengthening event that allows you to access keynotes and breakouts all year long for ongoing training in your ministry area. This year's conference features keynote speakers Fred Luter, Michael Catt, Todd Bolsinger, and Robbie Gallaty, as well as online and in-person regional events. Learn more at www.thesparkconference.com. We also have learning communities across Georgia to sharpen, encourage, and resource leaders personally and professionally. Find a community near you at gabaptist.org slash discipleship. Don't forget you can find our previous episodes on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and your favorite podcast platform. Now let's join today's broadcast or podcast. Hey, Disciple Makers, welcome to today's broadcast. Uh, we have a couple of rock stars on our broadcast today. I'll introduce them in a moment, but first want to remind you to leave a comment uh, in the chat if you're watching this with us live on Facebook. We love sending away some free swag, and uh, we go live every other Thursday inside of this group, so just say where you're watching from. Um, you know, if you if you have the book that gets like double points, maybe I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how that plays out. But we love sending away some swag and having you in the group. And my name is PJ Dunn, and so I have the uh, cool job of being the North Regions Discipleship Consultant here with the Georgia Baptist Mission Board, and uh, just crazy focused on disciple making and helping uh, our churches take their next step, uh, move the needle on discipleship. Which is why we have these two guys on today. So I hope I adequately introduced them. So we'll see how quick, see how good I do here. But uh, Steve Gladen is with us. And Steve has served as the small group pastor at Saddleback Church since 1998. He oversees the strategic launch of spiritual development uh, with over 7,000 adult small groups, 7,000 adult small groups. You heard that correct. Uh, Steve has authored several books, which we love, and we'll probably have in that swag bag for you, um, uh, including small groups with a purpose and leading small groups with a purpose, which is what we're talking about today. Um, and in addition to all of that and being an elder, travels around the world and uh, and is actually getting to do more of that now as the pandemic kind of eases. So Steve, welcome to the broadcast. And what did I miss or mess up? No, PJ. I mean, other than that, we are the rock stars with the shortest hair and the grayest hair. So uh, it must be a Vegas routine versus a you know main stage. <laughs> Probably a lot of jokes we could run down, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll hit that pause there and agree <laughs> agree a little bit with that. And then uh, we have Dr. Randy Stone on with us, and uh, uh, Dr. Stone is a mentor and a friend, um, but he's also a lifelong strategic discipleship guru. Um, and, and he's just done a ton with uh, church consulting and team building over the years and has a PhD in Christian education uh, from New Orleans Seminary. Um, and he currently serves there as a professor and he is the leader of Strategic Church Solutions um, and consults with churches. And Randy, I think you've worked with uh, churches from anywhere from 100 to 5,000 in different contexts. And, um, and, and just has a, a load of experience with, with what our Georgia churches are, which I'll talk about here in a second and kind of what that context is, um, but, but all the way up to, to working with uh, Steve and, and, and them. So welcome on the broadcast. And how did I do? How was that intro? Thank you. You did great. Uh, a good introduction is worth more than a real resume anytime. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going on Twitter. Somebody's going to put that on Twitter. Hey, I appreciate that. Uh, I've enjoyed working with lots of churches and, and uh, the colleagues and friends that we develop in this common disciple making effort is really valuable to me. So I look forward to our conversation today. Well, thank you both for taking time to, to be here and, and invest in our tribe here in Georgia. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've brought it up several times on here, but, you know, Georgia is comprised of a lot of different churches. So, of course, we have those top 1% churches in the country that we have several of them here in our in our state. But the, the majority of our churches, two-thirds of our churches, are going to be those bivocational, single staff, nobody else there guys. And a lot of them are watching on this broadcast today thinking, oh, man, we got the Saddleback guy and a professor. Like, they don't get us. But really, that's where we all spend a lot of our time. Um, and energy. But if you're watching and, and you run, you know, well over a thousand people on Sunday morning, maybe you have a couple staff members, 
these principles are true. And that's one thing I love about your book, Steve, and, mm-hmm. and just kind of where you come from. You're not, you're not saying this is how you have to do these things. It's not, it's not a, a mechanics and a wheel and those things that kind of like cog together. And it's like, there's your machine, go do it. I mean, you're really giving principles that will scale all the way down to that Bivo guy who's, you know, selling farm equipment. I'm thinking of a guy in particular, sells farm equipment every day of the week, comes on Wednesday night, comes on Sunday morning, and he's going, how do I even do this small group thing? And so that leads me to our first question um, over to you, Steve. So just unpack, what do you do in a small group? Like what, what is this small group thing? Let's, let's set a baseline. No, it's, and it's a great question. And I'll, I'll flip the question a little bit and uh, I'll ask the churches that are listening, what, what do you want them to do? Because what they should be doing is producing uh, what you would like in a disciple, which will again spin out to a question of what do you want to do in a disciple? Mm-hmm. And more times than not, uh, when I'm with churches, uh, I, what I find out is that they know the physical address of where their church is at, but they don't know the address of what, what they want a small group leader to produce. And, and, you know, when you're defining a disciple, a lot of times we have great catchphrases, but we don't have the infrastructure around these catchphrases to help explain what it's going to, what it's going to be. So to kind of answer your direct, your direct question, let's assume they know what a disciple is. They, they know what they're going after. They know the address of that disciple. They know what, uh, what they want them to be doing in their life then in a small group, you want them to be able to experience what you're wanting them to express. And so for us at Saddleback, just to give a a framework, doesn't have to be the right framework, but, uh, you know, when Jesus prayed in John 17, and when he summed up so much of what his mission and vision were in the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, we take the five verbs from the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, and that's what we want a group to do. Now, no surprise, when the church was birthed in Acts chapter 2, the, the first chunk of Acts chapter 2 was about temple courts. The back half was about house to house. So when you want the practical things that you want a small group to do, look at Acts 2, 42 through 47. And what you're going to see is almost everything that is being done in what is happening in the early church is that you, that's what you wanted to do in a group. And what can happen so often, I mean, like if I went to anybody and I said, hey, if you're in a relationship or you have a spouse and you're, you're saying, you know, hey, every date night, we're going to go have dinner and we're going to go to the movies and we're going to go home and we're going to pass out and go to bed. Um, you know, you do that for all your date nights. It's stale. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about a small group is if you're just going, hey, let's get together, let's do an icebreaker, let's uh, watch a video, or let's discuss a Bible passage, and let's discuss it, and uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll pray at the end. You do that all the time, you're going to have a stale group. And the beautiful thing about when you look at the five verbs, and we, we put them in day-to-day words like fellowship, discipleship, serving, evangelism, and worship, when you, when you say, hey, you know, have your group do a smattering of those. And the thing that's really fascinating is when you look at what they did in Acts 2 in their small group, what happened, and and when Jesus had his small group, what you don't see mentioned, like you do in temple courts, but what you don't see mentioned in the house-to-house side of things is you don't see frequency mentioned. And so it's really, you know, whatever it takes to make these things happen. How do you get authentic fellowship? How do you get people to know what their spiritual next step is? How do you find out what they're gifted in and how do they do that? And how does the group serve the church? You know, how do they do evangelism and how they engage with unbelievers? Because statistics would tell you, the longer you're a Christian, if you're not strategic, the more you're not going to even know unbelievers. I mean, yeah. luckily, I know Randy on the call, so I know that, you know, <laughs> he, he's good. Uh, and, but then how do you worship? So, you know, what we're trying to do is say, mix it up, mix it up, make it a variety. Sometimes the group will only do worship when they get together. Sometimes they won't even get together. They'll go do a serving project. You know, sometimes, you know, they will do what we call a more of a typical format where they'll, they'll come together and they'll have some fellowship and they'll go through a, a, a curricula. But the thing is, is you want to mix it up. And, and a small group leader should be looking 
every week when they're getting together and say, what's different? Because if it's the same all the time, you know, it's going to get stale. Yeah. Well, okay. Now I'm offended, Steve. So I'm going to, I'm going to pretend to be a first Baptist uh, pastor. Okay. And so what you just told me is that I don't know what's happening in my groups every week and I don't like it. So we get really structured in our programs and we say, this is what happens. I'm, I, I'm, I'm the leader of the, the church and I know how these small groups are going to go and they're going to be this way every time. And you're saying necessarily we need to have a framework for how they're going to work, but this week it may just be food and unpacking and prayer. And that's okay, right? Yeah. And that's why it's important. First off, you got to they you have to let them know what success is, mm. and that's why it's so important to define what a disciple is. And if because if you don't know, it's like if I invited you to my house and I said, "Hey, just jump a plane and come to Orange County, California," well, I'll get you within about three point three million people of me. Yeah. And if I told you my city, you're going to say, "Steve, dude, help me out." Just give me your address. I'll put it in the GPS. You won't even have to talk to me. <clears throat> and in the same way, you want to make sure that, you know, you want to give the address of what they're doing and, and empower them to get to the end in mind. And, you know, we have lots of tools. And, and that's why, you know, in infrastructure, you're going to have leader training. You're going to have tools. You're going to have a curriculum pathway because curriculum isn't just like, hey, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. What do you want to do? And you pick a curriculum or, you know, someone told us to do this. I mean, curriculum is a strategic tool to help you get health, spiritual health. And then the same thing is, you know, people that are helping coach and data. A lot of times we count nickels and noses, which is doesn't get us anywhere close to spiritual health. So what, what data do you want to get? So there's a lot of things that go into it. But, you know, what I would say to the person is, uh, at First Baptist in whatever whatever town you said, you got to ask answer the question: Do you want a structure for control or do you want a structure for growth? Mm. And if you're scared of the church being messy, I would encourage you to read the letters and the epistles because <laughs> it's too much more messier than that. Yeah, yeah. Can I try on that? Yeah, yeah. Can I try on that? Just the idea of the dress is 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 uh, important. I, I illustrate around here. We do a lot of goals and assessing and. When you talk about finding a destination, it, it's really tough to think, hey, if I'm going from one city to another, there's a lot of ways to get there. I can go on a car. I can go on a bus. I can go on an airplane. Here in New Orleans, you can go to St. Louis by boat. So there's a, and you get to choose which way you want to go. I prefer my private jet to take <laughs> <There> you, <go. laughs> um, you, you know, and it depends on, uh, are we, am I going alone or am I going with somebody else? Yeah. Uh, what's my analogy. cost going to be? There's so many factors in every variable, but knowing the destination is the first place. And then the group and the leaders working together to determine how do I get there is important. And that takes a lot of responsibility off of the, the significant leader or the pastor to manage all of that and allow the group to be able to make those kind of decisions for the best outcome for their yeah. group. Yeah. And let's, let's like double click on that, Randy. So, so you've done it and we've started on staff together years ago. And so I've seen you kind of, you know, orchestrate that and what that looks like, but you know, this idea of structuring for growth or control, but you can't always have both is super uncomfortable. And, and you've taken legacy. If we're going to use that word churches that have had a very traditional structure and mm -hmm. tried to move them towards that. And the end of what you just said is because if we set them free, then we've empowered volunteers. So some of our, our, our struggles right? Is that, well, I don't have enough volunteers. I don't have enough, enough time in the day to, to control everything. So if we let go of a little bit of that, and we're not talking about God's word and principles, we're doing that. So how do you find the balance in that, Randy? How do you get from that point to that point? Well, I think, it, and one of the things that I've really valued from Steve on a personal level in his books is they have a clear process and outcomes and they're, they're, they, they're, it's, they're training their people what they're trying to get to. <laughs> And uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit later about this, but uh, so many of our churches focus on the personality and the program rather mm -hmm. than the people they're trying to serve and the process to help them grow in Christ. Yeah. And that's, and you got to be process focused. And then if you know what the destination is, then you can, now our values as a church, our priorities of a church, those set guidelines, those are boundaries for us in a way, but inside that leaders, should have the freedom and liberty to fulfill their callings and giftedness and what the people with whom they're charged to work to move toward those larger objectives. 
Yeah, one of the things that's important to, for the listener to understand is the, the Bible's written on a family system. It's not written on a governmental system, although our churches tend to structure like the government and tend to be as effective as the government, no matter what side of the <laughs> aisle you're on. Uh, it's not structured like a school system. It's not structured like a military. It's not structured like a business. We're not building widgets. It's structured as a family system. And that's why the most important qualification for a pastor in First Timothy is, can you run your family? Well, why? Mm -hmm. Because it's a microcosm of the church. And that's why the motifs throughout the New Testament are always parent-child, not teacher-pupil. And when you understand the family system, and Randy, I'm so going to rip off your, your analogy on, on the trip. So uh, I, I'm confessing ahead of time that I'm going to steal it outright. Uh, but <laughs> That makes um, it okay. It makes yeah. it okay. Okay. But but the, the, the point is, is when you understand it's, it's built on a family system, then when, if you have a family and most of us have been in a family, whether it's broken or, or perfect or whatever route you want to go, but you, you understand that every, the longer, the more trust your children build with you, the more loose you get in the qualifications of, of how much control you're doing with them. And so when you start out your groups, a brand new group, needs when it's young it needs like lots of care lots of attention i mean and you, we understand biblically think of moses think of jesus the enemy likes to kill things when they're when it's young and that's why the longer a group is rolling and the more they're adopting your process the low the less hand holding they're going to need and the more adultish they're going to become and do it now is there tension in that letting go you bet. If anyone has raised kids, you know it's attention no matter what age process. But, you know, it's important that you understand the developmental process of a group and how you're helping them and the, and the village you're creating around them to help them succeed. And if you suffocate them too much, they're going to be living in your basement playing video games for the rest of your life. And failure to launch means a lifetime of dependency. Yeah. And, and that's a very great governmental model. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about uh, which, is, which is the hardest, you know, of those five for groups to, to consistently do, because I think we understand serving and opening the word and praying, like, which one's the hardest? Well, the, uh, let, me, let me flip the question. The easiest is going to be wherever the leader is gifted. Okay. That's why it's super important for the leader to understand how they're wired so that they can empower the people around the group. I don't, I don't leave my group. Uh, I'm all about fellowship and I derail the group. I, I mean, you know, our group used to meet on Fridays and whenever a blockbuster would come out, I'd say, hey, do you want to do the study or want to go see the movie? And everyone would go, ah, go to the movie, go to the movie. And so, you know, the leader's like going, you suck. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I can't believe you, you just did that to the group. And I was like, going, ah, that's a great movie. Uh, so but we'll have fun together and grow deep. But, you, you know, I'm passionate about, I mean, I could party all the time and, but you need people around you to, to help, you know, focus on discipleship. You need to, you know, recruit people. And what I've found that is in most groups, when you look at the five verbs, somebody's usually, you know, they, they lean towards that and you want to empower them. Well, if you're going to empower them, the thing that they need the most is they need ideas. That's why every month, to our group leaders, we're giving them one idea in worship, one idea in fellowship, one in discipleship, one in serving, one in evangelism, so that, you know, in the course of a year, they're, they're going to get, you know, I can't do the math, I can't do 12 times uh, five real quick, but, uh, but they're going to get a bunch of ideas, or we'll, we'll create tools and resources for them, so the thing is, the, where it's gonna, the group is gonna, always going to lean to is where's the leader, if you have a strong teaching gift, it's going to go heavy discipleship mm -hmm. and you've got to loosen it up and empower the other people. But it's going to be important that over the course of six months, the group can self-reflect and look back and say, how have we done in these five? Have we spent the whole time just being one big party zone? Yeah. Uh, have we just been serving the whole time? I mean, during the pandemic, our group was, we were overbalanced in that area. And so, and we always talk about in our small groups, try to work towards balance and, and not balance. Uh, think of balance in the sense of the verb that you want to harmonize. You want to take those five and harmonize. It's kind of like in a family, 
You know, there's times when you're pushing through the school year. There's times when you vacation. There's times when you just take a break. There's times when you do different things. But in a family system, you also understand every person in the family learns different. Yeah. And it's important that it's, it's about getting to helping them to get to where God wants them to be in the area of discipleship, not just one modality of how you teach them to do it. And so learn how your people learn and be able to say, uh, you know, this is a, a lifelong journey together. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And um, and, I, and I'm reflecting on like groups that I've been a part of in the past. And, and it's just the way you've said it just now, just like the light comes on, like, oh, that's why that group was so different. Oh, that's why that group was so different. Because, you know, you'd have some person who was really into teaching element, right? And you're like, man, where's the fun? You know, yeah. and then you'd have somebody that's like, we're all about prayer. So we only had five minutes of Bible and the rest was prayer. And you're like, yeah. come on, you know, we're, and then there was one group I had, and it was like, we went to Buffalo Wild Wings and they talked more about that than Jesus. And I'm like, I'm a terrible leader. Like I took them to <laughs> Buffalo Wild Wings, like, but it really does take balance of intentional. So one thing we would do with our singles groups is we would have like different uh, weeks for focuses throughout the, the 13 yeah. weeks or whatever. Right. So you'd have like a fellowship night with another group. You know, that way you'd share about what you're doing and have to you know, vary it. And then you have another one where you go out, you have a recap one, you have a kickoff one, you know, try to balance out throughout those. And I didn't even realize that's kind of what we were doing. But when you when you say it that way, it really helps it. And I, and I know there's people watching right now that need to tag like a Bible study leader, you know, or they need to tag their pastor. Um, uh, or if you are the pastor, you're kind of like, OK, I see what you're coming from. It's a balance. It's not just here's the curriculum, set it and forget it. Like we can't set it and forget it that way, but your, your idea of just sending out monthly, here's five ideas. I mean, you know, guys watching that, that's like a 30 minute email, you know, once a month that, that you could write them out for the whole year, you know, and just set it and forget it that way. So yeah. it's not that there's not ways we can't do that. Randy, let me, let me. And, and there's a lot of resources out there, you know, from other small true. group leaders that are often available online or Hey, contact some of the people that you respect that are doing small group, uh, the networks that are going on. There's resources out there that you can tap into if you're if you're not a creative thinker. Yeah, that, yeah, great point. Um, and and so Randy, let me let me ask you in that same vein. Okay, so we got the group going. They're kind of they're kind of moving. Like, how do we keep them going? Like, what's mm -hmm. the sustainable and focused part of this? You know, I guess we kind of alluded to the focused part, but like in your experience, how how are groups made to be sustainable, not just like launch them. Yeah, I think uh, the, I think one of the things, and, and it's where, again, I have to uh, defer to Steve because their church has probably done it better than any church I've ever seen in the world is staying focused on mission. Mm -hmm. uh, what, why do we, why are we doing what we do? And there is a tendency toward a drift from the mission if we're not careful. And you got to keep that to every group. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why is our group meeting? and keeping that focus uh, attention in front of them through communications and uh, different ways. Um, uh, and I think we have to motivate people. The leaders sometimes need a, uh, they, they need encouragement. They need uh, something to kind of keep them going because they're, they're, they're often under the gun from their, you know, personal lives or their people in their group or some outside forces we're not even aware of. And, and their motivation level may may dwindle, and that's part of our job as equippers in the church is to kind of keep them encouraged and motivated. And then um, I think the other thing, and that can be done through training and just words of encouragement or cards or whatever way you do that in your church, pat on the back. Um, so Y'all do not know, I, I mean, PJ alluded to it. He was on my staff before. I did a lot of leadership by walking around just – going through the real halls and just telling people, good job. Hey, I like what you're doing. That's a good thing. And it's amazing what even those little words of affirmation periodically help with our leaders. And the last thing I would say is, is metrics. Sometimes uh, I know people hate numbers, but in terms of health, of a, if I go to the doctor, the first thing I walk in, they weigh me, they check my blood pressure, my temperature, because if those things are changing, they know there's, let's start with there's some underlying issue here. And they check them every time to see if there's changes. And, and we kind of hate metrics in terms of our church and because we think it's not spiritual, but we do need markers to say, how are we doing? 
um, you know, whether it's the numbers, who's dropping out, who's dropping in, those things give us an indication of the overall health of our groups and our organization. And uh, I think that really helps us in a lot of ways. Yeah, so Steve, just what to, do you think? Yeah, when Randy, just to underscore a couple of things, the why always determines how long. Mm. Every time in everything we do in, in leadership development. And the church could really learn a lot from multi-level marketing companies. I know, I know there's a lot of churches that, you know, uh, you know, have a visceral reaction just by saying that word, <laughs> but I would encourage them to attend a rally that they do because I hate it when the business world takes biblical principles and makes billions of dollars and the church comes together and they do a gathering with their leaders. And I'm trying to figure out who died. I mean, what, what, you know, what happened? And, you know, when you're doing a, 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 a rally together, we, you know, we gather our, uh, our people who are our coaches that help in our small group leaders. We just did a retreat with them uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, but once a year, we gather our group leaders. But a little form you want to think through is always think, always have appreciation when you rally together. And with appreciation should come fun. If it's not exciting, if it's not a party, uh, please, you know, don't do it because you'll just discourage them. Uh, have vision uh, from your senior leader. And uh, even when um, uh, at one church, I only had five small groups and I would, we would, Lisa and I would bring them over to our apartment and I would still vision cast for them about what can happen because, you know, the Bible says without a vision, the people will perish. The third thing that tends to get missed is, you know, you want to make it about recruitment and next steps. And, and you, everyone's got a covenant to something at the end of that rally. And, and you want to make the next step card always, everyone can do something. Everyone can check a box somehow, but you're always trying to get what is the next spiritual next step uh, that they're after. And, and the other thing too, is understanding what sociologists will teach us um, because a lot of times the younger your kids are, the more they determine your adult friends. And what that can, sometimes as your, as your kids get older and they're going out of the nest, you, you see a natural difference move in some of the small groups. And it's just, and it's natural to, you know, how things will happen, but just, you know, always understand, take existing friends and take them deeper into what the gospel is always about. Yeah. And I, can I, and share, I, and I yeah, go ahead. Can I share one thing that uh, this kind of goes with this question, Anna? student this week sent me an email and he's um, he, he's uh, working on some things for his church and he sent me this email and he said uh, we've seen an uptick in our discipleship and our growth as a church I've not done anything different however just drawing attention to some areas that they needed to work on elevated the impact of that so part of it is it's not even doing anything different or doing something special it's just putting a spotlight on some things to say where are we and how are we doing just asking the question suddenly improves performance in some of those areas yeah yeah it just shows level of care right and 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 and, and for um if you're in georgia watching what, what our team loves doing is helping you accomplish these things. So what Steve's talking about, what Randy's talking about, doing a appreciation focus, you know, one time a year and doing like a training focus one time a year. And there's lots of ways that both of those can even flesh out. Now you have your everyday appreciation. You have your like going down the hallway, like Randy said, there's all these levels of appreciation, but doing like that celebratory you're doing it. You're, you're, you're crushing it kind of thing is, is great. And I've been able to speak at some of those events here in Georgia, but if you'll type in the chat, I'm interested in more in that. If you're in Georgia, one of our consultants will follow yeah. up with you, or one of these guys will follow up with you if you're outside of Georgia, because we really want to help you do that. And that's just a couple of quick conversations. It's not like this long drawn out thing. You have to read 10 books. I mean, there's some basic principles of appreciating and loving people and then equipping them to lead and, and really getting them excited to lead. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll take the go. Hawaiian and the Caribbean islands and Randy <laughs> can have the, the Midwest during the winter and the South during the heat of the summer. So let's split Thank it up you. that way. Uh, suffering for Jesus creates great rewards. Yes. There you go. There you go. So Steve, I want to ask you about like the assessment of health, you sure. know, because one thing that's really hard 
is to be objective. You know, we all think we're awesome when we start talking about our stuff. Like we don't tend to just lead with everything's awful. I mean, sometimes we do, but you know, like assessing our small groups and, and bivocational pastor, single staff pastor, or, you know, education discipleship guy that has a hundred groups under them watching this is thinking, how in the world do I know what's happening? And if they're healthy, how do y'all do that? No, I, I think there's a, a lot of different ways, and obviously it depends on the size of the church. And I would say the smaller the church, the more relationally you want to make it happen. Uh, it, it's kind of like in, in a family, the best learnings I get are not, you know, when I ask my kids a question, it's when I'm having a conversation and they're asking me questions and I find out what's going on. So if I were in a smaller church, I mean, we, we have tools that are available in my first book right there that you, you saw, Small Groups with Purpose. You know, we have a health assessment, we have a group assessment. Um, and again, a lot of times you can do it relationally over a cup of coffee. The, the thing I loved about being on staff at a smaller church is I, I knew the people, I would see them on Sunday, I could talk to them. And a lot of times on a quick conversation on a Sunday, you can find out more of what's going on in their group just by, you know, asking them what they're doing. And if you keep hearing the same thing over and over again, you're like, okay, I'll tuck that away and I want to help them out. So, but we do have some tools and metrics. We have an individual health assessment. We have a group health assessment. Um, the individual health assessment, you know, um, you know, again, you can read about it, but th the point is, is that it, assessing yourself is one thing, but kind of like what Randy said, when you have an external person, when you go to the doctor and they're doing an assessment, you know, when, when I look at the mirror, I go, oh, I'm not too bad. Uh, but when, you know, the doctor sees me, he goes, oh, you look pretty bad. Uh, so, um, you know, there, there's uh, in the health assessment, there's a friend feedback form. And the great thing is if if I rate myself up here, my friends weight, weight me down here lower, then, then I know that I might have an exaggerated opinion about myself. But if my friends rate me high in an area and I'm low in an area, I may need to, to say, man, I, I may have some talents and gifts. I'm just, I'm pushing down and I'm not, not jumping into, but the main thing is you're just trying to identify what's a spiritual next step. And in everything we do at Saddleback, we always give a crawl, a walk and a run. We're trying to give you a, Hey, here's a crawl step. That might be easy. If you're just trying Bible reading for the first time, or here's a, here's a walk step or here, here's a run step. So you always want to think developmental. And again, in a family system, you're doing the same thing. Some of your kids are at crawl steps. Some of them are at run walk steps. Some are at run steps. So we do have two tools. I don't want to get too deep into the, uh, to the methodologies of what we use, but the main thing is, is, you know, use those as, as a way to get ideas for your church. And a lot of times smaller churches go, man, I, I don't have the resources to do electronic tools and all that. Well, neither did I. I mean, yeah. when I was in this game, it was, it was all, you know, I think we were using tablets and, you know, car, you know, chisels, but, um, but part of it is relationally, sometimes you can know where an individual is at. And so I just encourage you to, you know, you can utilize our tools if you like, but at the same time too, don't make it more complicated than what it is. And if you're watching and you're, and you're using a tool, put that in the chat, right? Send us a link to it. Tell us what you're doing. You know, Exano is another group that has tons of resources, tons of questionnaires. There's all, but, but I think leaders ask questions, but make that's sure. a huge takeaway, right? Yeah. And they yeah. measure, right? We're going to, we're going to get data we're not just going to assume and we're going to, we're going to go for it. And asking questions can be hard because sometimes you get answers you don't like. So you have to be in the headspace to get those, those things. Um, but uh, Randy, Randy and well, I, when can, we I were hey, on can I day, piggyback on that with a story? This I'm a well, storyteller. Before, it happened last Randy, week. Before you go on the story, just make sure that whatever tools you're using, make sure they're measuring what you want in a disciple. Because a lot of times you can use a lot of different tools and they're measuring different things. So this alignment and, and focus are going to be super important when you're trying to get metrics and when you're trying to use tools. Absolutely. Sorry, Randy. Yeah, I, this is a story that goes to data and mission. I, 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 I was talking with a person at the church I'm serving right now about the coffee shop and they were selling donuts and coffee and Coke kind of, and it's like the money goes to camp. And I said, really, that's what that's for. And I, so I go and ask the the admin assistant the, and said, how much money's come in for camp through the coffee shop? And they said, we've not made any money in like four years. So I'm like, okay, so the data is telling us whatever that mission was is obsolete now because it's not really doing 
what the leader thinks it's supposed to be doing. Yeah. So maybe we need yeah. to adjust the mission or adjust yeah. the model. Yeah. But we, but we have a, but just asking the question, what's the purpose of this coffee shop? And is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? Well, the data said it's not. So we need to make some change, right? Yeah. Same thing's true in our church and our groups. What are you, why do you exist? What are you doing? How is that working for you? And if they're incongruent, we got to fix something, right? We got to change something. Yeah, hopefully that's, where, Facebook, that's where surveys come in handy to, to yeah. find out why is it not performing the way we want to. Hopefully Facebook doesn't shut us down or YouTube for using Dr. Phil's uh, phrase over and over again. But um, but it is like data is a really big deal. And, and one of the things that Dr. Stone and I connected on years ago, and I love telling the story, but, but, you know, asking the questions is important, but gathering them and getting enough data to make a decision is. And so, you know, uh, Randy's one of these, you know, high level guys in our church, and I'm just this intern, you know, at seminary, just, you know, wanting to do a little bit, right. And so they have this great idea that they're going to pass out uh, a sheet of paper assessment in the church four Sundays in a row, and we're running like a 1000 people. So this is like 4000 sheets of paper. And, and so With they multiple decided questions. Yeah, with multiple questions, like 10 or 15 questions. <laughs> and so Randy decides, wouldn't it be cool if intern PJ just goes over there and inputs all of that. Like I remember the room, how it smelled, how long I sat there making the Excel sheet, putting in 4,000 sheets of paper, you know, over a month and thinking, are we, this can't possibly actually do anything, you know, and I'm having all the thoughts and we get to the end of it and it really did give actionable data that, and I've not seen a church or been a part of a church that's on that kind of level of not just the questions, but having all of that data. And yes, it cost us some time, you know, like there was an intern, there was somebody in a room that had to do it. And sometimes we're afraid of the backside of the survey because we actually have to take the data and, and get a little bit of stuff behind it. So anyhow, it made me a better person, yeah. Dr. Stone. Yeah. I, I appreciate the refinement there. So. Glad to benefit your character. <laughs> Sounds like the therapist hasn't fixed the damage you've done, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. I'll send him the bill. Um, so Randy, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, again, it's pretty unique being that church consultant and seminary professor and walking into a lot of environments and hearing in the classroom setting pastors giving you live feedback. So mm. what are some reoccurring issues that you're seeing in these small groups and sustaining them? Yeah, I, I think that we've kind of hit on some of these in, in our conversations already. I would say the two biggest ones I see is uh, an over focus on personalities and programs rather than people in process. They like, if we get the right person, it's going to get fixed. Or if we just adopt this program, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. And, and that's simple answers, but most of the time ineffective. And so working through the, how we uh, work together to actually accomplish the mission is a challenge. And I think about coaches uh, like NFL coaches and different college coaches, you can either work with the people you got and build a system to try to win games, or you can have a system and try to then recruit people to be in it. But it's most of the time I have to, I have to work with the people I have. So if I identify my people, find a process to create a, a, a product that's, that's workable. Yeah, um, and, and tell us more about that. Okay. Cause there are a lot of guys that are going to resonate with that statement are you telling me I got to work with what I got? Because so often the message is just go find the leaders. And it's like, I, I run 20 people on Sunday morning, man. Like I know everybody, I know who shows up. And that's, that's a lot of the SBC. That's not a one-off church. And yeah. so your, your advice is start there. Start with one person. Who do you have? What are their skills, giftedness, callings? What's the biblical mandate? And how do we make those things move together? What process do we have? I think what Steve said earlier, we're not sure what the product is, and it really is people looking more like Jesus are to be the product. <laughs> Go and make disciples, right? And so how we do that, we got to we it's got to be contextualized to every context. And, and a lot of folks struggle with finding that adaptation uh, of that. The second thing I see is uh, when I get asked to do conferences, one of the most popular conferences, how to deal with poor and ineffective Bible study teachers. And the most of the first response is often just jettison, get rid of them. I don't like them. But, you know, I think we, there again, we have to work with the people we have. How do we take, are they, do we re-engage them because they've become disen, disenfranchised or discouraged or whatever? Uh, do we retrain them? Because a lot of people get thrust into a job 
a leader, a small group leader, Bible study, and they they never got a job description. They just like took over this group with a, without clear direction. How do we help them get to know what they're supposed to do? Uh, kind of motivate them again. And and if you can't do all those things, then they may be we, may, we reassign them sometime. Maybe they're in the wrong group they, instead of leading this group, they ought to be leading another age group or something like that. And if you've exhausted all that, and you're still gonna, then maybe release them. But most of the time we can remedy a lot of the problems of, that we've inherited or that we've enlisted ourselves through good training, good uh, motivation and good, good um, direction for people. Those are the two things I see. Yeah, that's that's fantastic, Steve. What what are I mean? You you actually have an international probably look on this too. So how does that differ internationally in America and around the globe? Even well, you know the beautiful thing about when God created us in His image, there's a lot of the the things that you know uh, will resonate. So I've been in a lot of different cultures with different languages. People look different uh, in different cultures of the of, of the language that's spoken, and and the the fundamental breakdowns are are pretty much across humanity uh, with that. And so I, I would echo just a lot of what Randy's saying is being able to, uh, you know, ha have, you know, not understanding the, the cute phrase of what a disciple is, but, you know, go deep down into that, into the layers, you know, you in the church, you get the time to be able to be able to use resources and tools that maybe others have created or that you're creating to help, help, you know, build those processes and and, you know, build into the people that can, you know, make the disciples that you want. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, across, you know, so many churches, you know, that so often we, we, we dis, we, th we think it's going to happen without spending the relational time. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's getting out there, it's being with the people and helping them have a pathway that is clear. So often in the church, we're, we're, we're jumping from one thing to the next thing, to the next Absolutely. thing, to the next thing. And having a, just a, you know, you're looking again in a family system. If the family stays steady throughout the 18, 20, 25 years, the end product's going to be much better. But if, it, if you're saying, you know, hey, I'm going to parent this way. And then three years later, I'm going to do this. And then no two later, I'm going to go like this and things like that. You know, it's just going to be super important that you have the consistency, but a lot of people don't have a process. They don't have a pathway The the sheep, the shepherd picks the next shepherd, the sheep don't. And so often we just leave it up to the sheep to, you know, meander through the way. And so, but it, again, it's, it's just all done relationally because you want to speak truth to them, but truth is built on a platform of trust. And trust only happens with time. That's why when you go to any major sporting event anywhere in the world, there's some Yahoo out there screaming, if you don't know Jesus, you're going to go to hell. Yeah. And he's speaking or she is speaking truth. But the problem is the source isn't trusted because they haven't spent any time. And in the same way, in a family system, you, you, you look at people say, hey, my teenager's off the rails. Well, how much time did you spend with them when they were a kid so that they trusted you? So when you said, don't do this, they won't do that. And so, I mean, that's not a perfect equation, but again, in, in church leadership, you got to spend time with the sheep. So you're trusted. John 10 talks about this. The sheep know my voice. They may only know your broadcast voice on the, on the pulpit, but how much time are you in the field with them to kind of coach them and challenge them and, give them the vision that they're there. So, well, uh, Jim, Jim Osterhaus said, um, trust is gained like a thermostat and lost like a light switch. Yep. And, and that's how quickly that and when we move and we move that over and over again, we really do lose that, that trust element of it. And, um, and so I love what you're saying. I love what both of y'all are saying. This is just great. And you know, where we want to, uh, park the bus. I'm trying to use something besides land the plane. Okay. That's the analogy that we say all the time, right? So we're, here's where we're going to park the bus. Um, I really want both of you to kind of, kind of lean in on this specific one because it, somebody's watching and this is where they're at. So many leaders watching this broadcast have Sunday school. They may call it connection group. They may call it life groups, but a Sunday school model in their church. And what they want to know is that our small groups and, and, or, and either both 
you know, what kind of solution is it for discipleship? Like, are you telling me I need to abandon everything that I have now, or is it the exact same thing? And how does it differ? Um, Randy, why don't, uh, I'll let you go first, Randy. Tell me a little bit about what you think. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to start with a, a, a sociological dilemma that's happened in our culture. I think when the heyday of Sunday school, maybe in the 50s, when we pinnacled out, um, sociologically, the community was the, the place where we lived, work, and play were the same. We went to school. We shared the same grocery store. Families were more intact. You know, we went, we played in ball games. And my third grade Sunday school teacher was my fourth grade uh, school teacher and things like that. Those, those days are sociologically, we're fractured yeah. from those days. So what's happened is many of the organizations have migrated to meet the needs uh, that have been uh, created because of that. So Sunday school is often moved toward a content centric Bible study orientation and lost the relational component that was already built into the community. And so there's this hunger for small groups that meet outside that we can actually get to know each other. And then those turn into party groups when there's no Bible instruction and no spiritual conversation many times. And so the reality is we need both of those. We need yeah. all of those things. And I, you know, the, and, and as Steve said, the five functions that they, how do we do that? And so some of it might be met at the church for instructional component or it might be in relation, but we've got to add all of those into our groups. The problem is we often squeeze out one or more of those from our church schedules and saying we're not making place for that because we've got you so busy doing activity instead of saying we're focusing on the environments that are moving people along these things. So wow. if you're doing one or the other, you may need to find a way to complement what's what is or is not happening to create that balance. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I, I, so let me let me start with this: is when the Bible, when Jesus created His playbook, it was temple courts and house to house. And um, one one of the 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 dangers of of you know thinking you know is it either or is it Sunday school or this? The the bottom line is we don't care where people are connected. I don't care if you're connected centrally on the campus. I don't care if you're connected at a house in the workplace. We, we have one group that meets at 35,000 feet in the air with Alaska Airlines. We have um, a couple groups that meet on yachts, which I tend to care for personally because my staff is enabled and inept to take care of them. Uh, but we have, you know, a number. So we don't care where they meet. What we care is what they produce. The danger of a decentralized small group without, you know, the, the processes and the people is it can just be sitting out there doing fellowship and not accomplishing what you want. The danger of being on a centralized group is that a teacher's running it and it becomes a mini temple courts. And so what, what can happen is, is when you understand the role that temple courts plays in the life of the church, and you understand the role that house to house plays in the life of the church, then, then the systems are working together. So, I mean, everybody would, I think would agree, you want to go to temple courts, house to house, and serve God where, where they're naturally gifted. And again, in American football, you have, you have offense, defense, and special teams. Nobody goes into the locker room when they lose and go, well, at least my team did good. I mean, maybe with your position coach, you do because you don't want to be grounded in practice. But, but the point is a loss is a loss. And so when the church understands their systems and when they understand there is one temple courts that, that's happening, we don't need a backup temple courts. And so the clarity of saying, you know, what are we trying to produce because there are great benefits to Sunday school. If, I, if I'm coaching a church and you have bazillions of Sunday school rooms, good Lord, fill them, yeah. fill them and make disciples in them, you know, because, you know, your, your child care is centralized and it's taken care of. And there's so many benefits of one-stop shop. If you got the parking, there's a lot of dynamics that are in on that, but there's, there's nothing wrong with meeting centrally on the campus. What goes array is when meeting central on the campus becomes whether it's midweek or whether it's you know during the week you know at a Sunday school hour the danger is when it's when it's running the temple courts playbook and then you have a church that has temple courts 
many temple courts on Sunday and many temple courts on Sunday night or Wednesday night. And you don't have any house to house. And house to house is your discipleship engine where people learn and develop to what God wants them to be. Yeah. Can I, can I piggyback on that with one last thought? Uh, script in the Bible, when I search out, there's a lot of instruction and religious activity that happens in the temple. And, and yet, when you look at where the miraculous happened, when Jesus did miracles and the conversions, they were often in the streets in the marketplace and houses. They, there's important things in, bo in both of those. And I think, I appreciate what Steve's saying. We've got to, there's, there's dynamics that happen in both places, but there's a freedom for the spirit to move outside of the constraints of the temple experience. Yeah, it, it's just phenomenal, you guys. You're you're both um, experts and leaders in your in your field, and it's just so fun to hear you all talk about these dynamics. And and you know, for a lot of those watching, we don't we don't get to have these kind of interactions. Maybe we didn't get to go to seminary. We can't make it to every conference. You know, we can't read enough books. And so to get you know like a master class in the last couple of minutes together of just what small groups are, what their purpose are, how we can launch them, how we can sustain them is really fantastic. And then now we go to work, you know, now we go do it. But, but both of your answers to the last question is, is really where our tribe is here in Georgia. Like we want you to move the needle on discipleship. How can we help you do that? So if you're going to choose to fill those, those rooms up on Sunday morning, let's do it. And we're going to make it the best it is. If you're going to do it at home, let's do it. Let's make it the best that it can be because we are for making disciples because that's what we're called to do. And we need to see disciples make disciples. So thank you all for being on the broadcast. Just absolutely stellar. And um, let's see, Steve, a uh, way to get a hold of you is smallgroups.net. Is that correct? Yeah, that or uh, smallgroupnetwork.com is a network that's a little bit more uh, diversified, but either one will will get me. I'm on every social media, so my cell number's out there. So just remember what time zone you're in. And what every time car, zone every in. car warranty knows it, that your number's out there too, right? So I, uh, <laughs> I have that. And pick up his books. Uh, both of those books you can pick up on Amazon, uh, but absolutely fantastic primers and uh, Dr. Randy Stone. Um, uh, I think it's strategicchurchsolutions.com. And how else that's can they get a hold of you? Uh, and how else? That's, Sorry. Oh, that's it. Uh, okay. Yeah, go there. Uh, and I also have, I'm here at the seminary. So my email here is rstone at nobts.edu. Yeah, big email fans. Email. We're a little biased in New Orleans. Sorry. All right, everybody. It just happens. That's where that's where I went. I'm a little biased. And so I have some love for Southwestern too, as, as does Randy. So thank you to uh, Lena Meldon for being our show producer in the background. She makes these happen for us. Ooh. And thank you so much to the cooperative program. Your cooperative program dollars help us do things like this and, and help the, the local church connect with other churches. I mean, just the, just the other night on a Wednesday night, I'm loving going out and meeting pastors and connecting churches together that would otherwise never interact with each other. And so we get to do that on this broadcast. We get to do that in Georgia. And so we just want to thank uh, you for giving to the cooperative program for that. So um, friends, thanks for your time. Hope that this has been a blessing to you and go and make small groups with purpose. Thanks for listening. We want to continue the conversation from today's broadcast in a learning community near you. These learning communities are designed to celebrate your biggest wins, resource your greatest need, and help you finish well. We also want to give you a free gift, the five discipleship shifts most churches need to make to produce world-impacting disciple makers. You can download this resource by going to ministryboom.com. This five-page PDF is a discipleship alignment checklist. The Georgia Baptist Mission Board is able to provide resources like this because of gifts from Georgia Baptists to the cooperative program. For more information on this broadcast and a customized discipleship plan for your church, visit gabaptist.org slash discipleship. Engage with us on your time through Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and all podcast platforms. Lastly, if you've benefited from this conversation today, please share this with a friend as we seek to help churches make world-impacting disciple-makers. <laughs>